What does it look like to live in the grace of Christ? I've grown up in church. I know the stories, the songs, the prayers. My head knows that we are justified by faith and not acts. But what about my heart? Do I truly believe that I am chosen and set free? And what if it's not all about me? The world is so quick to draw lines, to highlight our differences, but the word says that we are all one in Jesus, that the gospel of grace is available to all who believe. I don't want to be ruled by my excuses. God, help me see. Remind me that I walk by the Spirit, even when I'm tired. And even when I'm stretched, day by day, help me become more like Christ. Thank you for your spirit. And thank you for your word. Teach me how to live here and now. Well, good morning, Sanctus Church. My name is Joel, and it's such a privilege to be sharing with you this morning. I want to say an extra special hello to Pickering, our newest site, Bowmanville, and uh, poor Perry. Thank you for being here this morning. It's so great to be with you. We're in a series on the book of Galatians right now. Pastor John has been leading us through this book, and he's done some heavy lifting. He's done a really good job unpacking what Paul has to say to the Galatians, and it's so relevant for us here today. If we could summarize the whole series in one phrase, as as one person wrote and as John has been reminding us, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. In, in, in the book of Galatians, as John has been explaining to us, the gospel is spreading. It's not long after Jesus has come and risen and died and risen again and ascended into heaven, given us his spirit. Not long after that, the church is growing. And the church is growing in Galatia. And Gentiles are joining the church, but there's a problem. False teachers called Judaizers are infiltrating the church. And they are teaching that faith in Jesus Christ is not enough. They're teaching that you also must follow the Jewish customs, Gentiles being non-Jews. They are saying, if you want to join the faith, you have to also adopt Jewish customs. And therefore, what they're really teaching is you have to earn your salvation through obedience to the law. Paul comes around and he just shuts that right down. And what he says, as John has been reminding us, Jesus plus anything equals nothing. We don't earn our salvation. Jesus is enough. That message occupied much of the first half of the book of Galatians. And last week I thought Pastor Ben did a great job in a text that serves as a bit of a transition for the book. And what it says, what what Ben brought us through last week is essentially because of Christ, we are free. But don't go back, is what it says in Galatians 5.1 as Ben shared last week. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. And Paul comes along and he he explains the gospel and he said, listen, you had so much debt racked up, Jesus came and he paid off the debt. Don't rack it up again. Walk in freedom. Last week, that was the message. We are free, so walk in freedom. This week, what Paul wants to share with us and what I have to share with you is essentially how to walk in the freedom that God has given us. If you want to follow along in in your Bible, paper version, or on your phone, we're going to be in Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 to 25. How to walk in the freedom God has given us. Uh, I've probably shared this before. I have a daughter whom I'm obsessed with. She's almost 20 months old, so a few months ago she learned how to walk. And, uh, you know, you can see signs of it brewing, and you're really excited. You've always got your phone out because you want to capture it on video. And I remember several months ago, we were in our bedroom, and I was here, and she was there. I said, Sophie, walk over to Daddy. And she started walking. And it was one of the most craziest, amazing moments of my entire life, seeing my daughter walk for the first time. For those of you who have kids or grandkids, you'll know that after a kid takes their first steps, they've proven that they can walk, they still tend to kind of crawl around sometimes. And, and, and even though they can walk and now they have this freedom to explore the house, which makes all of us parents cringe, they still like to kind of go back to what's familiar, what's comfortable, because they don't have the confidence yet in themselves. They keep falling and tipping over, and like table height just happens to be the same height as like their head. 
Not that my daughter has ever hit her head or anything like that, but there's one thing between knowing how to walk and walking. Now she's, an, she's a pro, she's a princess, she's perfect. Everything about her is amazing. But I think that's a great illustration for what Paul is trying to get across. We know how to walk, but how do we do it? How do we stay in this mode of walking in the freedom that God has given us? Between last week where Ben took us and and this week in the second half of chapter 5, there's a a key verse that links the two verses together, the two passages. In Galatians 5.13, Paul says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. You've been called by God to be free, and Christ has enabled that. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Paul introduced this idea of the flesh earlier in the book of Galatians, but he didn't really go into it very specifically. But now he wants to go there. He wants to unpack what the flesh means and how this impacts our desire to walk in freedom. He says, yes, yes, we are free. Building on what he wrote in the first half of chapter 5, of course, yes, we're free. But two things. Don't go back. Don't go back to crawling. You know how to walk. And, and, and don't let your guard down. Just because you're free and just because Christ has conquered sin and death and darkness on the cross doesn't mean that we just coast now. Doesn't mean that we let our guard down. We are still living in a fallen world. The, the inauguration, the full inauguration of the kingdom of God has not yet come. We are living in the in-between. So there's a conflict. Here's what he has to say in chapter 5 starting in verse 16. So I say, Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with one another, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. What Paul is beginning to teach here is that there is a war going on inside each one of us. Those, who have, those of us who are believers, those of us who are not, there's a, there's a war going on between, for us who are believers, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit who lives in us, and the flesh. There's a war going on. By flesh, he does not mean our physical bodies, but he means our sinful nature. See, there are two natures at work in every Christian, the spirit and the sinful nature. Our sinful nature, as Tim Keller teaches, is the part of our hearts which is not yet renewed by the spirit. Now, you may say, I thought I was a believer. I thought I had the Holy Spirit. I thought that that was done. I thought I've been renewed. But this is the the process of sanctification, which we've touched on in this series. It's just a fancy word for meaning the lifelong process of becoming more like Christ. And we believe that you never fully get to the end. You never arrive in that process in this life. And the implication then, of course, is that because we're not finished that process of becoming like Christ, there are parts of us that are not like Christ. And that's what Paul is saying here. That is called your sinful nature. And your sinful nature is in this ongoing competition. It's like between the old self and the new self. And that's why, because of this competition, Paul says we don't do what we want. And this picks up on a familiar verse that Paul writes elsewhere in Romans 7 where he basically says, I do what I don't want to do and I don't do what I do want to do. He says sometimes I want to do good, but I feel the urge to do bad. And sometimes I want to do bad things, but I feel this urge like I shouldn't do it. I should do a good thing. It's like as sure as gravity. It's like if you try to jump up in the air, you're going to come down. There's this force coming at us. Every time we try to do good, every time we try to do what is right and obedient to God, there's this force coming against us and vice versa. And they are in battle with one another. See, what Paul wants us to know is that the Holy Spirit and our sinful nature want completely different things in our lives. The Spirit wants us to be more like Christ. The Spirit's main concern is not material things for your life. It's not ease and comfort. Those things might come. God might bless us with those things. But God has a higher agenda for your life than comfort and material things. God is trying to make you more like Christ through his Holy Spirit. Now, what the flesh wants is to bring us back into slavery. What Paul is referring to here, don't go back, is that you've been saved. You've been given the gift of salvation. You are now free. Don't go back. Don't keep racking up the debt again. But that's exactly what our sinful nature is trying to do in our lives. And and, and the sinful nature tempts us and lures us in, in two opposing kind of opposite ways. First, through sin. 
You could call it license. You could say to yourself, and Paul addresses this all kinds of other places in the Bible, since I'm now free and since I'm saved, I'm going to go live however I want. That is one way that the, the sinful nature tempts us, and it's wrong. The other complete opposite way is through uh, self-salvation, moralism, legalism. It's by saying, I'm going to be so good, I'm going to follow every rule, and I'm going to make God love me. I'm going to earn my salvation. That's what the Judaizers were pushing. And, and Paul comes around and says, listen, you can't just live however you want. You, you can't give in to the license and sin all the time. You don't know Christ if you do that, if you live that way. But the same token is true on this side. You can't prove that you're good enough because you're not. You can't earn your salvation. That's what the flesh tries to do. It pushes us in either direction, and the spirit is right down the middle. And see, Paul is writing this letter because the Galatians had a sin problem. The church is being infiltrated with Judaizers who have a, legal, a, a license problem, a legalism problem. And he comes right down the middle and say, listen, those of you who are living in sin, you need to stop. Those of you who are, who are trying to do Jesus plus something else to earn your salvation, you need to stop. Let me tell you about the gospel. He says the way of the spirit and what the spirit is trying to do in us is neither of those things. Our freedom is not an opportunity to indulge in sin, and it removes the need for us to earn our own salvation because Christ has already earned it for us. Paul gives us the solution to this problem in verses 16 and 18. He says, walk by the Spirit and you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. And he says, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. He says, listen, to win the war against the sinful nature, we must walk by the Spirit and be led by the Spirit. This is the most important phrase in the passage. He says a variation of it four different times. He wants us to get what this means. He says, when you do these things, when you walk by the Spirit and you're led by the Spirit, we will not be under the law, slave to approving ourselves, slave to legalism, and we will not indulge the flesh. We won't be slaves to sin, slaves to license, slaves to our sinful nature. Basically, what Paul is saying here is, listen, for all of us, whether you're a Christian, you've never been to church before, you're here for the first time, or you've been a Christian all your life, he says, there are two ways you can live your life. There are two ways. Uh, you can live in the spirit or you can live in the flesh. This is kind of a, a can be a one-time decision for us. Am I going to become a follower of Christ? And it's also a daily conversation for us, and we'll get more into that later. It's kind of like the question that you ask when you're a kid. What do you want to be when you grow up? I mean, I, I wanted to be a police officer when I grew up. It's like asking the question this way. When you grow up, Joel, do you want to be a cop or do you want to be a criminal? As you grow up, you think, of course, I want to be a cop, but it, you, you learn that it's a little harder to be a cop than a criminal. From my outside perspective, there are rules, there's training, you have to wake up early, you have to go to shift work. One of my friends is a cop, he tells me all about it. It's, it's great, but you have to have discipline, you have to train for it, you have to kind of be good. To be a criminal, you just do whatever you want. There's no rules, there's no shift work, you just <laughs> do whatever you want. And it seems easier because there's no boss of me, just do what I want to do. But there's kind of one fundamental difference between the two. One, the cop, at the end of their shift, after they've worked hard, they get to go home and be with their family. And assuming the criminal eventually gets caught, they go home to a jail cell. And they are the opposite of free. Being a cop might not be a perfect job, but at least you're free. You get to go home with your family. Paul's saying, listen, what kind of life do you want to live? Do you want to be free or do you want to be a slave? There's only one way to be free. So let's take a look. He leads us through what life in the flesh looks like and what life in the spirit looks like, because it's up to you. It's your decision. So let's lay it out and see what he has to say. First, here is what the flesh looks like. Galatians chapter 5, 19 to 21. He says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul says, listen, you can walk in the power of the Spirit and find freedom in life, or you can walk in your own power, walk your own way, and live in the flesh. If you do live in the flesh, let me tell you what your life is going to look like. The more you live this way, your life is going to start to look like these things. He lays out 15 different things, 15 different sins that come as like the fruit or the result of living in the flesh. 
Tim Keller categorized these 15 things in a, in a very helpful way. There's, there's sexual sin here, religious sin, relational sin, and there's substance abuse at the end. Let's just go through them very quickly. First, sexual sin. Sexual immorality. He says, if you live like this, and sexual immorality, as Pastor John has taught many times, it's like this Greek word, porneia. It's, it's, it's sexual activity outside marriage. Impurity, unnatural sexual relationships and practices, debauchery, uncontrolled sexuality in any form. Then he goes to religious sin, idolatry. Now, he is speaking contextually to the Galatians because they had a real idolatry problem with pagan or occult religious practices. For us, it's less temple worship perhaps sometimes, but for many of us, it's idols that we create in our hearts that is a, a disordered love, a, a, a misprioritization of the important things in our lives that de dethrones God from first in our lives. Witchcraft, accessing unholy spiritual power in any form, also very relevant for many of us today. He goes to relational sin, and this is the focus really for him and what he's getting at. He, he, he talks about how the flesh destroys relationships, which is so critical for a church conversation. He starts with hatred. I'm not even going to define it. I'm just going to raise the question, how can we hate each other when Christ did not hate us, but rather loved us when we didn't deserve it? Discord, it's a form of disunity. Jealousy, it's being discontent with what God has given us. Fits of rage, outbursts of unrighteous, uncontrolled anger. Selfish ambition which is the opposite of the self-denial we're called to as believers. Dissension, a form of disunity. Factions, another form of disunity. And envy, ultimately, is the opposite of love. And then lastly, in the fourth category, substance abuse, he names drunkenness and orgies. And, and the two of these are linked. The second one is not a sexual orgy, but it's actually a drinking orgy. It's like wild partying drunkenness and, and, and drinking orgies. See, what the flesh does is it leads us into excess and addiction and misuse. It perverts what is good and what is right, and it takes it far too far. And then he ends with saying, and the like, because this is not an exhaustive list of sin, of course, but this is a contextual list that applied specifically to what he'd been observing in the Galatian church. Now, I want to point something out really interesting uh, about this list here. There are what I would call external sins, like drunkenness, and then there are internal sins, like jealousy. What I noticed growing up in the church is that the external sins uh, were elevated to something that was much worse, and there was a lot of shame involved if you were to do some of those things. Uh, but jealousy, discord, you know, those things sometimes got a pass or we didn't see them as serious as the other things. Paul very clearly, by, by kind of mixing them together, says there's no distinction between the two. Whether somebody else can see your sin or not doesn't make it any less sin. And that's not to, to uh, downgrade one, of the, one or the other. They're, they're all serious, and one is not worse than the other. Paul gives a strong warning for those who live like this, and he gives another promise. This passage, if you can see it, riddled with promises. What comes from this life is ultimately slavery and death. If you live like this, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, what he's referring to when he says, if you live like this, is the habitual practice of doing these things, not the infrequent, repented of lapses. We all make mistakes. Sometimes we give in to temptation. What we do in that moment is ask for forgiveness and move on because Christ has given it to us. But if, this, if you stay there, if this becomes lifestyle for you, you, you've got a big problem. You've got to have a conversation with God about it. So we don't read this verse and, and be afraid, because this verse does not change the assurance that we have as believers. We are saved. But we also don't read it haphazardly either. We, we fear God as, as we read this verse. We, we, we are reminded that we cannot let our guard down. This is serious. We can't drift into a different lifestyle that God has called us to, and we can't drift back into the lifestyle that he has called us out of. That's what the flesh looks like. This is the way of the world, and let me tell you, from experience, it's a trap. Living your own way looks like freedom. We all know this. When we grow up, parents have all kinds of rules. You just want to break free of the rules so you can be truly free. But as a parent now, I know firsthand the rules are there because they love us. There's danger lurking on the other side. What looks like freedom is actually slavery. It's a lie. And so many of us have fallen into it and still fall into it. 
I grew up in the church, as I've shared before, and, you know, I grew up with some rules, and I was a pastor's kid, so there was a lot of expectations on me, basically, to be doing this now, but it wasn't a straight line to get there. When I was in high school, I decided that I didn't want any more of this whole thing. I stopped going to church. I got into some really harmful relationships. I developed a lifestyle that was not good for me at all, basically exactly what Paul is describing here. That's what my life looked like. And I, you know, of course, didn't use these terms, but I decided not to live in the spirit and to live in the flesh. I did that for a couple of years. And by God's grace, man, he called me back earlier than I certainly deserved at all. But he, he called me back and now I'm here. But what I discovered was the freedom that I was searching for in drinking and partying and relationships and rebellion was not freedom. Sure, it felt like freedom at first, Sure, I didn't have to worry about my parents' rules anymore once I moved off to university and got to do my own thing. But I soon found out that there was nothing there. There was nothing there. In fact, there was worse than nothing. There was slavery and bondage there. I found no freedom. I found no life. And I know that many of you can vouch for the same thing. It's a lie. The way of the world is a trap. Paul comes along and he says, listen, you don't have to live like that. You don't have to be trapped into that way of life. There is another way to live. You can live in the spirit. Let me show you what life in the spirit looks like. Galatians 5, 22, 23, he says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. He says, here's, what's result, here's, here's what results from living in the spirit instead of the flesh. And again, Tim Keller helps us with a lot of this. He starts with love, because it's the fountainhead of, of all good things that God has. Love is serving others sacrificially for their, good, for their good, not our own. Joy is like this subterranean river of delight that is unfazed by the circumstances of life. It just keeps going. Peace, confidence, and rest in the wisdom of of God and that he is in control. Patience, I need more of this one. <laughs> the ability to withstand difficulty without getting angry. Kindness, I think so underrated. Serving others practically and caringly. Goodness, it's like integrity. Being the same person in every situation. Faithfulness, to be utterly reliable and true to your word. Gentleness, to be sensitive to the needs and the feelings of others. Self-control, disciplined to pursue the important over the urgent. I mean, does anybody want more of those things? Do you want more of that in your family? Do you want more of that if you're married, in your marriage, in the way that you're, you're, you parent your kids? What about at work? Be nice to have some of that at work, some more of that. What about here at church, in our church family? More goodness, more gentleness more peace, more love, more joy. Paul is an amazing writer. He always chooses his illustrations carefully, and he chooses the illustration of fruit for a reason. What do we know about fruit that informs us about how the Holy Spirit works in our lives? Four things. We know that fruit grows gradually, inevitably, internally, and symmetrically. See how this applies to the conversation. Fruit grows gradually, which means it, it grows in us slowly but surely, after, often underground and unseen. The Holy Spirit is working in your life if you are a believer and you are walking with the Spirit. You may not embody kindness all the time, but it's happening. He is working gradually behind the scenes. Inevitably, it grows. There will be growth. This is a promise that if you are a Christian, the Holy Spirit will bring these things out in your life. One year from now, you should be more loving, more joyful, etc. It's just inevitable. It's like a seed that falls into the ground. It's going to grow as long as it gets sunlight and nutrients, which is what the Holy Spirit brings. It grows internally. For fruit to grow, roots need to grow. And usually roots take a long time to grow. Like I said a moment ago, you might not see it at first, but it's happening. And fruit grows symmetrically. See, this is not the fruits of the Spirit. This is not like a basket of fruit that we pick out the ones that we need. Like, oh, I'm really lacking in patience. God, give me more patience. You can certainly pray for that, and you should. But this is more like a bundle of grapes 
than a basket of fruit. They grow together. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's what all comes from walking with the Holy Spirit. And Paul says, against these things there is no law. And the reason he says that is because there is no need to limit the growth of what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life. And in this, I think we really see the contrast between living in the flesh and living in the Spirit. See, the law, which he references here, existed for the purpose of restraint. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. But there is no need to refrain the work of the Holy Spirit. We just want more. Now, I mean, I think living in the Spirit sounds great, but how, how do we do that? How is the Holy Spirit able to do this work in our lives? Paul answers the question in verse 24. He says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And the reason this verse is critically important is two reasons. First of all, he references Christ Jesus and his crucifixion. And he does this because our freedom and, and the opportunity for us to walk in the Spirit of God is because Christ Jesus went to the cross. This is not just something that happens without his death and resurrection. When he died for us, he took our sin on the cross, and he, and he paid the penalty for it. He conquered the power of it. And because he went first and died a death that he did not deserve after living a sinless life, after leaving heaven and coming down to earth, he went to the cross and he was brutally murdered. He was crucified for us, for me. For that decision I made back when I was a teenager to walk away from him and everything that I did, everything else I did, he died because of that. And because he did that, we can be free. Because our passions and desires were crucified with him. The second reason this is important is because when we walk in the spirit, we also crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. Which, which kind of means two things. Number one, Christ has dealt with it once and for all. It was a one-time event and the benefits last forever. Secondly, though, we are not passive in this process. We don't just sit back and enjoy the benefits and expect life to be easy. Our role is to crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. Our role is to every day decide that I'm going to die to self and not let my sinful nature rule the day and not give in and to walk in the spirit. And that's actually probably more, more than a day-to-day -day thing. It's, it's a moment-to-moment -moment thing. Christ died for us. Now we die to self every time we are faced with that decision. I, I love this verse in Matthew chapter 16. It summarizes the idea and so much more. Jesus, when he is teaching, said, whoever wants to be my disciple will deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Listen, we live in a world that just says, do whatever feels good. Do what you want to do. I mean, this ancient text is incredibly relevant for us today. It's, it's speaking exactly against that cultural mantra and saying, if you do, just do whatever feels good and do what you want to do all the time. You decide what is right. You decide what is wrong. Here's where it's going to lead you. But Paul comes along, actually, rephrase, Jesus comes along before Paul, and he says, if you really want freedom, the, the answer is in by following me. And what did Jesus do? What example of Jesus do we follow? He lived such a sacrificial life that it was sinless. He did not give into the flesh once, although we know through scripture he was tempted. And secondly, he went all the way to the point of death in sacrificing himself for others. Self-denial to the nth possible degree. Thankfully, we don't have to follow him to the literal cross, but we do need to follow him to the cross figuratively every time the sinful nature comes up against us. And that's where real freedom is found. So how does Paul want the Galatians to respond? What, what do we this morning do with this? He ends in verse 25 with a very clear application point. He says, since we live by the Spirit, he is speaking to believers now. He's speaking to the church. Since you have the Holy Spirit and since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Holy Spirit. Now again, the image is intentional. 
It's not just a word that he throws in there. He chose the, the phrase intentionally, keep in step with the Spirit. It's like when I go for a walk with my wife and I, and I walk so fast that I end up being 20 feet in front of her, it, we don't have a very romantic time. Like, we're not feeling like we're bonding. And likewise, when I fall 20 feet behind her, the, the same thing. We're not really walking together. We're still married, but we're not really spending time together. You imagine it's like a trip to Florida uh, when you have two vans in like a caravan and one just wants to drive as fast as possible and the other one wants to obey the speed limit. Eventually you get so far apart and separated. It, it just doesn't work. So one of the ways that we respond to this, one of the things that we take action on as Christ has done all this for us is we keep in step with him. We keep in step with the spirit. We don't get too far behind and we do, don't get too far ahead. And the way we keep in step with him is by doing the things he desires and not doing the things that he doesn't desire. This takes discipline. Now, we talk about spiritual disciplines all the time. And if you are uh, faithful in your spiritual disciplines of reading the Bible, praying, fasting, it will lead to more power in your spiritual life. But I want to, like, de-spiritualize it for a second, if I can, as a pastor. Discipline is just a regular thing that we all need in our lives. Waking up early requires discipline. Uh, being able to save up and afford a home to live in, to, to feed your family, it requires financial discipline. Uh, I listened to this podcast by a guy named Jocko. He's a former Navy SEAL. You might have heard of him. Absolutely love the guy. He has this mantra that just says, listen, discipline equals freedom. Financial discipline equals financial freedom. If you wake up in the morning before you want to and you go to the gym every day of your life, you're going to be healthier. And that brings physical freedom. This is just a basic concept. And I think we need to exercise freedom in our spiritual lives just by doing the basic things, like not doing what the Spirit doesn't want us to do and doing what He does want us to do. Now, the, the beauty of it is the Holy Spirit actually enables us to do what the Holy Spirit wants to do. We can't fall into the same trap and try to do this in our own power again. He enables us to walk with Him. And He's like a good parent. You know, when I used to go to the mall with my mom when I was a little boy, I always used to get so annoyed that she would walk so fast because my little legs couldn't keep up with her. And I told her, and she adjusted because she's a good mom. And I think the Holy Spirit is like a good parent that, that he goes at our pace. He goes at the pace that is best for us. Now, he doesn't put up with dawdling. He, he wants more for us and better for us. But he's not a slave driver either. He's not going to allow us to get too far ahead and too far behind if we're listening to him. He is leading us, and he is enabling us and giving us the power. So we keep in step with the Spirit. The second thing, just to go a bit deeper, we run from sin. That is one of the ways that we can engage practically as we try to keep in step with the Spirit. It's slavery. It's a trap. What the world says is freedom is not freedom. It's slavery. It's a trap. Remember Galatians 5.1. It says it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So stand firm. That's ours to do. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. We got to stand firm. This is a war. There is a war going on inside each of us between the spirit and the sinful nature and the enemy, because make no mistake, this is not less than spiritual warfare. This is spiritual warfare as well. The enemy hates you. You will not be shown mercy. You will be tempted when you are at your weakest, when you're tired, when you're hungry, when you're angry. You will be tempted when you will give in. He will trap you and try to destroy you. We have to stay on our guard. We have to stand firm. Our best defense is not just prayer. It is prayer. Stay disciplined with the spiritual disciplines and keep asking the Holy Spirit for help. But we participate by not giving ground. We don't indulge the flesh and we don't try to prove that we're good enough. We are not passive in the Spirit's work in our life. We are active. And we participate by crucifying our sinful nature every moment, every day. Again, the Holy Spirit gives us power. He always gives us a way out, as the scriptures say. But we need to do our best to walk with him and keep in step with him as he leads us. I want to ask you if there's an area of your life that you have been indulging into the flesh. Is, is there something that you need to confess this morning? And say, listen, I, I, in the past I've kind of struggled with this, but it slipped into a lifestyle thing. Or I seem to really struggle with this a lot. Or this does mark my life. Listen, jealousy, nobody can see it because it's within, but I'm filled with jealousy. I'm filled with hatred towards this one person. The Holy Spirit is inviting us this morning to walk in freedom, and he is inviting us to confess our sins so that we can be free. 
we hold on to bitterness and we harbor hatred, it's us who lose. We become the slaves. We step into bondage. So I want to ask you this morning, what do you need to crucify in your life? And maybe it's the opposite side of the spectrum. Maybe you need to crucify, crucify legalism. Maybe you need to kill this desire that you have to prove that you're good enough and to earn your salvation. That is just as bad as the other thing, even though it looks good on the surface. Both lead to slavery. So we keep in step with the Spirit. We run from sin. And most importantly, we run to Jesus. That is the most practical, greatest thing that we can do in this battle. In this war, we run to Jesus because Jesus is love. Jesus is joy. He is peace, patience, and kindness incarnate. He is the fruit of the Spirit. And he embodied it for us. And we can see what a life like that looks like. It leads to victory. It leads to eternal life. It leads to freedom and communion with the one true God. And that's the reason why God sent his son Jesus into the world to die for us. So that we would not be left in slavery. He came to set the captives free. And that's exactly what he did. I was a captive. You were a captive. You may be a captive right now. Jesus came to set you free. The answer is not found in what culture says. The answer is found only in him. So we seek Jesus. We seek the fruit of his spirit. Memorize them so that you can pray every day. I try to do it as often as I can. God, fill me with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Memorize them so that you can ask for them, but know that Jesus is the most important thing. And if you seek him, the rest will follow. Because he is so good, and he has come to give us freedom and life both now and forever. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord Jesus, you are so good. You are so good, God. Thank you, God, that you sent your son into the world. Thank you, Jesus, for obeying the Father and for giving us freedom and life. Lord, thank you for challenging us. Thank you that you care so much that you don't leave us on our own. You don't leave us to the ways that we think are right, but you step in and you remind us and you teach us how to live. We pray, God, that you would fill each one of us and you would fill our church, even our country, Lord, with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. Thank you for showing us what that looked like, Jesus. Thank you that you are doing this in our lives, even if we can't see it. One year from today, would Sanctus Church be stronger in each one of those areas? And would I and each person here as well? We love you. We pray that you be glorified in our devotion to you and our worship this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.